Hershon Detti. So, I'm near the end of my Albanian adventures and there's just one more story I feel like I really need to tell people. Uh, and so, I got three buses and a taxi and I've come to the historic town of Kruje where there's a bazaar, there's lot, we're in the middle of the mountains but most importantly, there's a big castle. Now why have I come to essentially in the middle of nowhere? Oh, no, I fell. Why have I come to essentially in the middle of nowhere to tell you this story? Well, because this isn't just any old castle, no, no, no. This castle, and this town in general, is the scene for one of Skanderbeg's most impressive achievements. It would be kind of like trying to tell the story of William Wallace without going to Stirling, you know, so I needed to come here, needed to be done. Now the trick is not to break my ankles on the cobblestones, that's always difficult. As nice as this old bazaar is, I did not come here for mere trinkets. I came here, came here for the castle and to learn some more about Skanderbeg. There's a character who, oh there he is. This part of the world, you've got streets named after them, you've got big statues of them pretty much everywhere. And when I explain to you what this guy did at the castle up here, you'll understand exactly why and you'll be, you'll be like me, you'll be mortified that you didn't know about this guy sooner. Right, there's a sign for the castle there, I think we're on the right road. Here's hoping. Whilst I attempt <clears throat> to traverse this hill, which I will do with absolutely no grace whatsoever, let me tell you a wee story then. So Skanderbeg, like lots of young noblemen of his time, oh, look at that view, ignore me, look at that view. Perfect place for a castle. But anyway, so Skanderbeg, like, like lots of young Balkan noblemen of his time, spent the early part of his life with the Ottomans. What the Ottomans used to do is they would tell folk, they would tell lords and kings and the like, give us your eldest son or give us a couple of your sons in some cases. The idea was if those young boys are brought up in the Ottoman court, they would grow to appreciate Ottoman values. They would maybe learn to be good soldiers the Ottoman way. But most importantly, if you're a lord or a king or some sort of nobleman, 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 and the Ottomans have your kids, you're far less likely to rebel, aren't you? Or at least that's how the theory goes. It didn't always work, but it did sometimes, and so they kept doing it. So Skanderbeg spent the early part of his life in the Ottoman court, he even converted to Islam for a while. And it was because he spent so much time in the Ottoman court when he was young, he became very well trusted, they, they liked him. Uh, in fact, his name isn't actually Skanderbeg, it's uh, George Castriani or something along those lines. I'll need to uh, brush up on my language skills here. Castriotti, Castriani? Castriotti, let's go with that one. George Castriotti, his name was. The Turks, or the Ottomans, called him Iskanderbe and then it was later changed to Skanderbeg for, you know, reasons. Oh yeah, I know exactly where I am, don't you worry. So, he was in the Ottoman military and he learned how to fight like an Ottoman. Which came in handy later on when he stopped fighting for the Ottomans and started fighting against the Ottomans. But we'll get to that. I think that's where I'm wanting to go. I'm going to assume so, because it's got security, and that means there's probably some important stuff in there. 
as you probably know by now, I don't really do museums because I've paid for every museum I wanted to go to, I would have no money left, so I just don't go to museums generally, but I've made an exception and I'm sure you can understand why exceptions need to be made. It's not just Skanderbeg in here though, this place was the centre of the resistance against the Ottomans, that's true. But there was a castle here well before the Ottomans. This was the centre of where the Illyrians had their stronghold as well. And we've got this plaque here and it says, as for the Illyrians, you know what, I'll let you read it yourself. As for the Illyrians, for them, is more honourable to be sovereign and free than to be submitted to slavery. They are people that can't be put under conquest. I like them already. I like them already. And, of course, helmets, spears, arrowheads, shield, the works. It was 500 lek each to get in here, so you're talking about 450, 4 pounds 50, 4 euro 50, something along those lines. So, hi, good investment, I would say. This is a very, very new museum, I think. I think they built it not too long ago. And I'm glad they did. One of the interesting things about this particular museum, it's not just the ancient Illyrian stuff, you've also got Middle Age stuff, so we've got your Skanderbeg era stuff as well, so we've got these very nice windows there. But this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this, this is a war horn. You can just imagine the sheer amount of noise that would have been generated by thousands of these things going off before an attack. The intimidation would have been unreal. Here we have a very Ottoman looking chap. He's not got a war horn, he's just he's just screaming at the top of his lungs. He's he's game for it, he's ready. There's no stopping this guy. I don't know if he's Ottoman, Skanderbeg stopped him, so maybe there is, maybe there is. Those look like chains. A map of the Ottoman attacks in the Balkans, ah, okay, they, those, those do look like chains, don't they? Hmm. There you go. So this part here, you've got, you've got Greece, but Albania would be up here, there we go, there's Kruja, there's Kosovo, over here we should have what would have been Constantinople, yeah, there we go, Constantinople. The Ottomans were absolutely ferocious back in their day. Wasn't many people, wasn't many armies that stood against them in one at least not until the 20th century when they started to go into a bit of a decline because they failed to modernise but back in these days, back in your 15th century type thing or type era I should say ah, they were terrifying I've found what I've come here for specifically I came here for a number of reasons but ahead of me I've found it if I'm not mistaken I found Skanderbeg's helmet and saw his actual one. Look at that. Not only is that a cool helmet, not only is that a massive sword, he must have been quite a tall guy to swing that thing around, but not only that, but you've got the nice dramatic music playing and some other genius, because obviously Skanderbeg was a genius, but some other genius has painted this. I'm going to assume the guy there 
the one with the white horse, the red cape, and uh, oh, I don't know what else he's wearing, he's got a gold belt there, and I assume that's supposed to be Scandalbeg himself. Now I told you that this is where he achieved one of his greatest feats. So let me tell you just how impressive this really was. He managed to gain access to the castle. Now how did he do that? Because he was horribly, horribly outnumbered. So what he did, right? <laughs> he, uh, he kidnapped a politician. I know, bad start, but needs must. He kidnapped a politician and he forced that politician. He forced that politician to basically forge a letter that he handed over to the Ottoman garrison. Now the Ottoman garrison, because they trusted Skanderberg and they didn't realise he'd defected yet to the Albanian resistance. The garrison took him at his word, let him in. And then, when the commanders of the Ottoman garrison left, because they thought, okay, the new guy's in charge, no problem, everything's cool. He then snuck the rest of his guys in, and there wasn't that many of them. There then was a little bit of slaughter going on, he murdered the entire Ottoman garrison that were left, he slaughtered them in their beds. Not the nicest of things, but like I said, needs must. That's the excuse I'm going for. This place is incredible. He then defended this castle with around 3,000 troops. 3,000 troops he had, 3,000, that's it. He defended it for like one particular military, one particular army of Ottomans that was around about 100,000 strong. So he defended a castle with 3,000 guys against about 100,000 at one point. You can see why they like the guy so much. <laughs> you can see why the guy's a natural hero here. He was... There's an argument to be made that without Skanderbeg and without his military genius, that he just continually beat the Ottomans. It wasn't this one Ottoman force that he defeated. He defeated them time and time and time again. And he was always outnumbered and he was always outgunned as well. But he managed to beat them each and every time. I suppose being in the Ottoman military previously would have given him an idea about how they operated, how, what their tactics were like, how they thought, how to lure them into traps and stuff like that, because how do you continually beat such big armies thrown against you? Well, number one, by being a bit of a genius, and number two, by understanding your enemy, and Standerberg really understood his enemy. Oh, I should probably mention as well, he converted to Christianity after he slaughtered the entire Ottoman garrison, so... Again, you know, needs must and all that. Ah, oh, religion, right? Before I got myself so distracted there by all the amazing things running about me, I was about to say, there is an argument to be made that without Skanderbeg, and without his exploits, there would probably be no Albania. Now I know it's it's not it's not a one hundred percent statement. There is, as I said, there's an argument to be made. But of course, the story of a nation is the story of any nation, really, especially one as old as this. The story of a nation has a lot of pieces to it. You know, it's like a big puzzle, and without one piece, you arguably don't have the rest. Yeah. The guy's a national hero, and interestingly enough, he's not just a national hero among Christians either. There's a lot of Muslims who venerate the guy, who really, really like the guy. So, and I know he was brutal, and I know he did some things that are a bit, a bit iffy. You know, he, like say, he slaughtered an entire garrison of people. You don't, he slaughtered thousands of men in their beds. But then, you know, Robert the Bruce stabbed the guy to death at a church altar. History's complicated and morally ambiguous to say the least. Now of course, 
no man fights entire armies on their own. I mentioned that Skanderbeg had 3,000 guys with him. He wasn't the only resistance leader either. We have guys like... You're about to hear some really, really guys like this guy. You're about to hear a really bad attempt at pronouncing his name. Well, for George, I think that's how you anglify that word. George Ariarite, who was distinguished general in the Albanian uprisings. There's Georgie boy. Another military strategist there. This here, I believe this is Skanderbeg's sister. Sister of hero, come on. Commandant woman of Petrella Castle. Okay, so she's not just merely the sister, she done some stuff in her own right too. Heroes galore. Aye, so he obviously had help, he obviously had other other leaders, other other men who, and women for that matter, who were brave enough to stand up to the Ottomans. So you might be wondering, well why did they, why did they rebel? Why did they stand up and fight the Ottomans? Apart from that natural feeling we all have, that natural inclination for freedom and independence that most of us have. Well, it's fairly simple actually. When Skanderbeg's dad died, Skanderbeg was given some of the land, not all of it, he was given some of the land to govern. Now this didn't really sit very well with him, but he, he felt he'd served his time in the Ottoman military, he felt maybe it belonged to him. Arguably it did. So, that was when he kidnapped that politician, forced him to write a fake letter, and came in and slaughtered the entire garrison in the dead of night. I know, I know, it's a wee bit, it's a bit awkward talking about it because it's killing human beings at the end of the day and believe it or not, I actually really, really, really like Turkish people. But, you know, someone invades your country, occupies it, and get a wee bit murdery themselves on occasion, so, you know, let's just say that. You might feel slightly justified in taking whatever means, or taking whatever course of action you felt necessary to get rid of them, especially when you're so terribly, terribly outnumbered and outgunned. I think one of my favourite things I've seen here so far is, I mean, there's lots of really, really beautiful statues and tributes to Skanderbeg. One of my favourite things is just this wee guy. <laughs> this wee ginger-haired boy, and he's just, he's got himself a rifle. He's, uh, <laughs> Uh, he's ready to go to town with somebody. I don't really know how that relates strictly to Skanderbeg, but here he is. He looks very happy. And he's ready to rock and roll. Look at him. Absolutely no danger. Of all the things I expected to find here, this was not among them. A random Scotland flag. And I have absolutely no idea why it's there. That particular plaque is written in Italian, so it's an Italian exhibit bit with a Scotland flag in it. Don't know, no idea, not a clue. But that's interesting, so there you go. Oh, right, I need to get out of this museum before my head explodes, man. This is just, this is one of the best places I've been in a very long time. I highly, highly recommend if you want to come to a museum that's worth paying the money for. The museum here in the castle of Kruya is definitely on the list for you. Get it done. Just notice this very, very interesting sword as well. Um, it's not Skanderbeg's sword, what it is. It appears, based on what I can see there, it appears to be a sword that was used at roughly the same time that this sword was used by, or used by an ally of John Hunyadi. Now, if you know anything about this period, about the resistance to the Ottomans, you know John Hunyadi was the famous Hungarian resistance fighter. Who caused the Ottomans a good few headaches as well. It's saying here that the 
basically this was donated on the 600th anniversary of Skanderbeg's birth by the defence, oh sorry, the Ministry of Defence in Hungary. One thing that always kind of blows me away a wee bit is these swords always look, they always look really massive and look really heavy. And I'm thinking to myself, I would struggle. I would genuinely struggle to swing that around for any extended period of time. And people back in the day were supposed to be roughly the same height as me. AKA short arses. I mean, we talk about how unfit and unhealthy people back in the day were, but pff, I mean, really? You need to be fairly healthy to swing that thing around, don't you? I mean, you, or you would think, at least. But I suppose if your life depends on it, you just get filled with the adrenaline, don't you? Filled with adrenaline and a burning hatred of the invader. <laughs> All right, pal. I don't have anything to say. I just think that's really cool. Oh, I'm so happy. So many flaws to this museum. It's difficult to tell where to go next and what to show, and what's relevant, what's not relevant, but... Oh, here we go. Here we are. Hello. Oh, it is. Oh, we found ourselves in the outside. Thankfully, it's not. Ah, it's going to rain. It's definitely going to rain. But I'll show you the view in a second. You'll realise just high, how high up in the mountains we are. I'm amazed it's not been raining so far. Ah, this is what I was looking for. Holy! Wow. Ah, this is like the perfect place to put a castle. You can see why he was able to defend it. Why it was so important to get a hold of it in the first place. Wait till I show you this. You can see for miles and miles and miles, and as you can see there, we are in the clouds. You can just sort of imagine Skanderbeg and his compatriots standing up here. The Ottomans, Monday Yabams, you know, the usual talk. I have not been this high. That makes that sound bad. I've not been this high in a while. That sounded bad, didn't it? But you know what I mean. Let's see, got a wee look at the town below. Can you see in there? Ah, there we go. So you've got the what's on the entry to the old bazaar. In the distance there, I don't know if you saw it. Those of you with a beady eye will have spotted something that I'm normally quite interested in. I'll go there later if I have the time. The trouble with getting here is there's not a lot of buses and stuff. That's why I had to take three of them and a taxi, like I mentioned earlier on. You'll probably hear me mention it a couple more times because it was a lot of effort and I don't normally make it. So, here we are. Walking in the footsteps of heroes and giants. That's what you need. Good for the soul. Okay, so why am I showing you this map? Well, I'll tell you why I'm showing you this map. This here appears to be just a random list. I, don't, I think this is a list of all the places people have written books about Skanderbeg. I believe that's where it is. I did mention Stirling earlier on, didn't I? About how coming to Albania and not coming to Kruja to talk about Skanderbeg would be a bit like trying to talk about William Wallace without going to Stirling. Well, there you go. There's a, there's a weird little coincidence for you. I think this piece of artwork here 
was probably worth the admission fee alone. Right, I right, definitely look at that, that's incredible. Uh, looks like the rain has started whilst we were in the museum there. But of course, I didn't travel all this way to be deterred by a wee bit of rain. I'm from Ayrshire, I was born in the rain. I think in front of me there, if I am not mistaken, I think we've got the remnants of the old mosque because of course Skanderbeg was a human being. He was a genius but he was a human being and human beings die. And so when he died the resistance didn't last very much longer after him. He was sort of the linchpin that held it all together. That's why his that's why the other leaders, that's why his friends, his colleagues, his allies, whatever terminology you would like to use. That's why they chose him as their leader, as Lord of Albania. Now, Albania didn't actually exist as we know it today, but like I said, the story of a nation is made up of pieces. And so when Skanderbeg did eventually die, the Turks had a bit more luck, and eventually they conquered most of the region. Something else is probably worth mentioning as well. He didn't defeat the Turks or the Ottomans. I don't want to offend anybody, you know, but they were Turks, weren't they? And as cool as Turkish people are, I absolutely love Turkish people. They're some of my favourite people in this entire world, right? They're so much fun, just as a general group. I think I've been to Turkey about four times and I've loved it every time. I'm actually going to go back to, to there uh, after I go to Macedonia. I'm hoping to go to Istanbul for about three weeks, but you'll get videos, don't worry. Skanderbeg defeated the Ottomans. He defeated them when they were at the height of their power. This wasn't when they were on the decline or anything like that. I may have mentioned this already, but it's important to emphasise this guy was... This guy was absolutely curb stomping the Ottomans when they were in their element, when they were at the height of their power, when they were conquering places like Constantinople, when they were led by Mehmet the Conqueror. Did it matter to Skanderbeg? Nope. Nope. Big man had a plan. A ruthless plan, but again, arguably an, es an, an essential plan. I mean, how else would you would you have done it? How else would you have taken the fortress? What else you gonna do? Chat the door and say, hi there, I've defected. Can you let me in, please? No. That's how you end up with your head on a stick. So he did what he needed to do. And I'm sure that's the, the argument any rational person would use. As brutal and as horrible as it was at times, That's medieval war. There's less of an excuse for that sort of behaviour nowadays, of course. But, back in those days, you did what you needed to do. <clears throat> and if you do it well enough, they'll make statues of you. Remember I told you we were in the clouds? Well, I wasn't exaggerating for effect. We are quite literally in the clouds. And I don't know whether I just heard a truck going by or whether it was thunder, but... I think it might be time to go and find something to eat. Although, this is me we're talking about. I'll probably get distracted along the way and start talking about something else. Some people like going to the beach. Some people like getting drunk. 
Me, I just like walking around castles and talking shite. And if you've made it to this point in the video, I'm guessing you quite like that as well. So you're in good company, I guess. I mentioned getting up this hill was going to be difficult, but like I said, it started raining since then, so... Getting back down, it might be quite difficult as well. I think they have free healthcare here in Albania, so... <laughs> I might be, might be needing to use that soon, uh, if this goes horribly wrong. Oh, f oh this, is, this is absolutely... This was a bad idea. Totally worth it though. Loved that museum. Cool castle. Hopefully it came across on the camera. But, the day is young. And since I'm here, I've decided I'm about to go and try and find some traditional Albanian food. I don't quite know what that means, but we're going to find it together. Unless I'm in the a &E, obviously hit the jackpot. We're walking along thinking where can I get some traditional Albanian food. And we found this place, I'll show you the sign when I go out, and it said Albanian traditional dishes 300 lek. I'm a man who loves a bargain so I'm really looking forward to this, I hope it's nice. Now I have absolutely no idea what this is. I think it's some sort of goulash. But to be totally honest, on a cold day like that, what more could you possibly want? Absolutely no idea what's in it, but it's good. Oh, I can eat this. That's on the daily. Yeah, anyway, go away, stop watching me eat. You know what? I have absolutely no idea what meat that was. I don't know what most of it was. But I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. It only cost 300 lek. So... 270, 280, something like that. I'll wait until Colty's finished eating, then I'll find out what kind of meat that was. <laughs> I thought it would be a better idea not to ask until I was done, but aye, that was, that was real, that was good. So as it turns out, that was beef, pork and lamb. Fine by me, no problems here. Courtney absolutely hates lamb though, so that was quite funny. Watching her sit there, <laughs> try to try to eat this thing. I could tell she was having a horrible time, but you know, I wanted the authentic Scandabeg experience. You know, go to his castle, he's with his great achievement, and eat some of the food he might have eaten. Okay, I might be in a bit of trouble here. walking directly towards me with malice in their eyes. And what are you doing in this part of town, son? You ate my pal yesterday. You're right, I did eat your pal yesterday. That's right, and he was, and he was nice. But that wasn't just the reason why I put my camera on. Oh, that's... I hope that's a firework. I hope that's a firework. You're not the Serbs invading. Right, let me show you something wild though. Right, of all the mental things I've seen today, this has got to be one of the wildest. Now, I've seen a few of these when I was driving here. Well, I was on the bus, I wasn't driving, I was on the bus, I saw something and I thought, no way, maybe I've misread that, but no, I found another. If you had a bakery slash ice cream shop, what's the last thing you'd think to call it?
read that correctly, it's the George W. Bush Bakery. No idea, I don't know why. There's actually a statue to George Bush in one of the other towns here. I would have went to see him, but I didn't think it was worth all the trek just to see a statue of some guy I don't particularly like. Uh, but aye, there you go, you've got your George W. Bush bakery and ice cream shop. And in the town next to this one, you've got a statue of George Bush. I wish I had an answer for you. I really, really do. Doesn't make any sense, does it? But there you go. Well, folks, I think we're going to have to call it a day at that, unfortunately. The heavens, well, they have opened. And the other thing I was going to show you, it would only be good if the weather was you know, behaving itself, but it's not, and so that gives us some a reason to come back, doesn't it? So, that's why I'm standing in this very dodgy, dodgy looking parking, parking area, trying to find the bus station to get out of here. But anyway, don't know about you, but I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> See you next time.